Good morning, Pastor Brad from Emmanuel Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining with us again. Every week you're here, and uh, it's always good to open God's Word together. I always look forward to it. I look forward to being in, in it, proclaiming its truth, sharing it together with you, learning from it. We're in uh, the Gospel of John. Looking forward to that. In the Gospel of John, we have seen this last week. John just emphasizing this. If you love me, just emphasizing the need for us to be in a love relationship with our Savior, with the Father, and also emphasizing the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and also we'll be talking about that again. We're in chapter 14 of John. We're going to be in verses 27 to 31 today. And really what's going to come up today, this theme he's going to develop, he's speaking to the disciples, uh, to the need of their heart, preparing them for what's coming tomorrow. This is Thursday night as they meet. Tomorrow he's going to be crucified. They're going to go through the weekend. Um, and then, and just all that's swirling around them right now and the uncertainties and the fears that they have. So he's speaking to that. As he continues writing in this final discourse, he brings up the topic of, of joy. We're going to be looking at the topic of joy this morning. How much money would you spend to have joy right now? If you, if you could pay an amount of money and have, have joy, if you could have peace, if you could have peace in your heart, that's going to be the theme, peace. If you could have peace, how much money would you pay? What kind of things bring uh, peace to us? What kind of things destroy peace? Uh, are you at peace right now? Are you at peace in your heart with yourself, with God? What does peace feel like? Are peace and quiet and peace of mind the same thing? Well, let's look at this, this, this whole teaching on peace, these few verses that we have together. Experiencing the peace of God, what is that like? You know, one of the great ministries that you have, and I've seen it in your life as I've watched you, and I've seen it in my life as God has worked in my life, is just the testimony of peace. Whether it's at a funeral and a loved one has, has passed on to go be with the Lord and just the peace of God that, that is there among, among your hearts and, and our hearts together. Whether it's the peace of God that's sustaining us through uh, real challenges in life. I've seen it in your life, and it's a real testimony. God harnesses that. God uses that. That's an encouragement. So God is speaking to the disciples, and they need this emphasis. They need this teaching, and so do you and I. This is an area we need reminded of all the time. So we come to verse 27 as we consider peace and what it looks like in our life. And we just remember this. It starts and ends with Christ. John's going to pick that up here in this verse. Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Jesus Christ is the source of our peace. It comes from him. It is from God alone. And it can't be found anywhere else. It's, it, is a, it is a precious commodity. It, it is a commodity that was uh, near and dear to the heart of Jesus. It sustained him through the challenges of, of his own ministry while he was here in the flesh, incarnate in the flesh, while he walked on this earth. He modeled that for us. And we're going to see that this morning. In Romans chapter 5, peace begins when we have that that first step of faith towards God, receiving Jesus Christ as Savior, entering into a relationship with the Father. We are declared righteous in that moment. And by faith, we have, for the first time, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. You know, I don't know how long you lived before you met Christ. Maybe you need Christ this morning. I don't know what that is. But there's many places that we look for peace. It begins with an encounter with Christ. It begins by faith in Christ. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 that Jesus Christ, he himself, he is our peace. He has made us both one. He's broken down the walls. The scriptures remind us that when Adam sinned, sin came upon all of humanity for all time. Jesus stepped in with his own blood, his own sacrifice. He stepped in as a spotless lamb of God. He died on the cross and he took our place on the cross for our sins. When he did that, he broke down that wall. There's a barrier between between humanity and God because of sin. When Jesus went to the cross, he broke that down. And so when we, when we enter into a relationship with him through faith, for the first time ever in our life, we experience what real peace feels like. Colossians chapter 1. Through Christ, we are restored to God. We are reconciled. We don't use that word all the time, reconcile. We're restored to him because we have made peace with the Father through Jesus Christ, his work on the cross. Romans 5.10 puts it this way. We were enemies of God. Now, now we are restored to God. When he died, he restored us. 
He, res- he gave the opportunity for man to be restored to God. When he rose from the dead, he secured that salvation that we experience when we come to him in faith. And so his work so powerful in our life. Isaiah 9, 6 reminds us that, that one of the names of Jesus Christ, one of the titles that is given to Jesus Christ, this child, this son who would be born from Isaiah, this prophecy, is that he would be called the Prince of Peace. Now, when he walked down the street, they didn't call him Prince of Peace. But that's a name that is his. It belongs to him and him only. And we will worship him someday in, in glory with that name and so many others. Colossians chapter 5, we're reminded, because of all these things are true, to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to let his peace as a child of God have control in our heart, in our life to let it have its way, to yield control of our emotions and our, and our thoughts and, and, our, and on all the things that are in our heart, yield those to the Lord and find peace in Christ. He is the starting place. Verse 21, verse 27, as John continues, reminds us of this, that, that the peace of God, it's, it's foreign to this world. It's alien to this world. Jesus says, this peace is not as the world gives, that I give to you. What I'm giving to you, it is mine. What I'm giving to you, it's not found in this world. We can't dig it up somewhere. Uh, we can't discover its existence somewhere. It can't be, it can't be purchased or bought or sold. Um, no amount of looking, no amount of experience, uh, no amount of time uh, will man be able to uncover the secret of what true peace is all about because it's from God alone. And so he's giving it to us through through his sacrifice on the cross, he is enabling every child of God to experience the full blessing of what peace is all about. But you know, we're all looking for peace. Uh, we all desire it. You desire it this morning. You're listening this morning. You desire that peace. Whether I'm a child of God or I'm not, I'm not connected with Christ, and that's our desire for you. We are all looking for those moments where we are experiencing the peace of God. The world is looking for it everywhere. We're looking for it through through uh, maybe looking within ourselves, having those meditative moments or places or opportunities, having peace and quiet somewhere in a beautiful setting. Um, we're looking for organizations to, to try to provide world peace, NATO or, or the Peace Corps, doing their work around the world. We're looking at it through uh, bringing all peoples together and being uh, inclusive and being diverse and agreeing together. Uh, loving, you know, loving one another. All these things are good, but we ultimately can't manufacture and produce the fruit and the result of what peace is by doing all these things. They're all empty. They all fail to bring the peace that you're looking for, the peace that I'm looking for. Only, only Christ can do that. And so we keep searching and we keep looking. Psalm 28, 3 reminds us there are those who, who speak peace who speak kind words, and yet underneath their motivations are evil. And, and a false peace is found in just uh, manipulating the people around us to try to attain results and, and to get uh, um, accomplishments by using people to our advantage. Luke chapter 12, verse 19 reminds us that uh, this is the parable of the rich man, and he built barns and set himself up just to, be, just to have everything he needed. He didn't, he didn't have to worry again. He had, he had all the riches man could possibly want, and he was set. What he lacked was peace. What he lacked was a relationship with, with uh, God. And his soul would be called into account that very night. He would stand before the Lord ultimately without the work of Jesus Christ covering his life because he lacked faith. His false peace was found in the things that he had, in the security of those things. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, we see Satan tempting Jesus and promising Jesus everything in this world. It's interesting, isn't it, here? It's like saying to Jesus, who owns everything, give it to me and then I'll give it back to you. And then you yield to me. What, what Satan is, is ne- never sure about, even though he's a, he's a student of God's word, he knows the word, he knows the scriptures more than many Christians. What he still never, never was able to capture was that though Jesus was in the flesh, he was still fully God. He was hoping and looking for and searching for vulnerability in Christ that he would that he would give up everything and yield to Satan here. And you know we look for peace the same way to have control to be in to, in control to have everything at our disposal to have it all to be in charge. 
And uh, that's really that's really important. Um, it's just we're always looking, we're always looking. We just want to control things and have it in our life and just have all the answers. And and one thing that we understand and realize that peace is not a byproduct of being in control. When I'm in control, there that's not the answer to the peace that my heart is so longingly searching for. Control isn't the answer. Satan was offering that. Satan was offering a kingdom and everything. And you can be in charge. But what was missing there was worship to the one true God, yielding to the one true God. Peace also, as, as John continues and unveils the words of Christ, peace is also powerful. It's, it's, it's uh, overcomes in our life. You know, he's speaking, he's speaking to the, to the troubled hearts. Um, he's speaking to the fears that they have. In fact, here in verse 27, he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. You know, in the first verse of this chapter, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And he continues on in that to be distressed, to be agitated, to be to be completely uh, turned upside down inside in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. Um, so before we explain this, I want to look at Christ himself, because Jesus right here says, and he says also in, in verse one, let not your hearts be troubled. But consider consider Jesus Christ for just a second with me. As we look at his example, we see this. In, uh, in John chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, we see these, these examples here. In 1133, Jesus is going towards the tomb of Lazarus. Uh, Mary is weeping. The Jews are weeping, and he's troubled in his spirit. It's the same word. In John 12, 27, Jesus, Jesus cries out to his father, uh, before the people as a witness and testimony, save me from this hour. Now, he know, we know that he would go on to say, but not my will, but yours be done. In chapter 13, verse 21, he is troubled again, and he, and he explains why, because he says, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus is, is walking in the midst of a storm that is swirling all around him. The, battle, the battlefield is set. Uh, the spiritual warfare is set. It is it is swirling all around him. Satan is at work right now. He's going to go to the cross and stand in our place, and so he is engaged in the in the in the the deepest of battles that has ever been fought. He is engaged in warfare to a to a degree that we have never faced, even in warfare in hum, in the in the experience of of humanity. It is a spiritual warfare. And, uh, and he feels those emotions in, chap in Matthew chapter 27 while he's on the cross as he finishes his work. He cries out to his father and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's feeling the emotions as, as God in the flesh, as fully man. He's feeling those emotions of being separated by, by carrying the weight of sin. He is still fully God. He's a part of that triune trinity that's never broken, not for a moment. But in this moment, the weight of sin has created a, 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 some kind of barrier that we can't understand judicially between, between God and the Father as he's, as he's taking the wrath of God for our sins. Hebrews 4 takes this thought and reminds us, though, that as Jesus was, was put under these pressures as he, as he ministered to us and loved us, as he was squeezed by the spiritual battle, as he was, as he was forced into a corner, as it were, uh, as he took our sin upon himself and became sin who, for, uh, who knew no sin, as he, as he was all these things, as he was tempted and fought these battles, we are reminded here in Hebrews he did it all without sin. He never sinned, not once. Even though his spirit was troubled, in that troubling, he never, he never sinned. He never experienced sin. He felt the emotions, the anxieties of the battle around us. You know, we can't live and not be affected by the battles that we fight. We can't help but be not be affected by the emotions that we feel. We see sin and its chaos and the havoc that happens. We see it impact the people that we love. We're caught up in spiritual warfare ourselves. And yet we can experience peace in our soul that is, that is grounded in faith just like Jesus Christ did. And that's what he models and shows to us here. In fact, in verse 16, he goes on to say, you know what? Because that's true, you can run to me when you're in the midst of these battles. You can run to me to find grace and mercy. You can have confidence this morning that whatever your need is in your spirit and your soul and your heart, as you're walking faithfully with the Lord, as you're facing the world without Christ, you can have confidence for the first time that as you run to me to the cross and receive forgiveness, 
that God will bring the peace of being right with God into your heart for the first time. If you're a child of God, He will bring the peace of being right with God in that relationship. That is a promise. John 16, 33, Jesus says, I say all these things to you, that in me you might have peace. He says there's tribulation everywhere. There's battles everywhere, outside and in your soul. But take heart, I've overcome. And you can overcome too. Doesn't that bring peace right there? You can overcome. You can be overcomers. Your heart can be settled. So what does all this mean for us? Well, John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. We come to him in faith. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We're one and the same. Philippians 4 eight. We bring our anxiety to him in prayer. And we find peace replaces that. We run to him with uh, thanksgiving in our heart. Even though we don't have things figured out, we don't have all the answers, we come to the one who does. And he settles our heart. He settles my heart. He brings the peace that only he can give. Where there is a stirring all around us, he settles our hearts on the inside. John twenty nineteen. after the day on Friday, that evening, after he rose from the dead, the, the disciples are back in the in upper room together and, they're, and they're, uh, they're there together, they're afraid. They're afraid that the Jews are going to find them. And Jesus, Jesus, they haven't, they've, they've, they know that Jesus rose from the dead, but he's not there with them. And all of a sudden he appears and there he is. And he says, peace be with you. And, he, and that fear runs, that fear hides, and Jesus calms their heart. Isaiah 41.10 is a great scripture that reminds us when we, are, when we are filled with these anxieties and these turmoils and we feel dismayed inside, he just simply says these words, I'm with you. I am with you. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. I'm your God. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uphold you. I'm going to hold you with my righteousness, my righteous right hand. I'm going to do what's right in your life. Mark 4.39 Jesus is with the disciples. They're in the boat. Storms come up all around them. The disciples are hardened men. They're fishermen. They know what it's like to be in a storm. These storms right here terrify them. They're afraid the, the boat is going to fill and they're going to drown. Jesus is sound asleep. They, they wake him up and he says to the sea, he rebukes it and he says, Peace, be still. And the winds and the water calm instantly. That's what he does in our life. His ability to sleep in the midst of the storm just shows that he's in control. And when he wakes, he just brings that presence of his peace into our life. The fourth thing that we see about the peace of God is this. It's true even when he's not physically with us. He's going to say to the disciples here in verse 28, I'm going away. Now remember in verse 3 of chapter 14 right here, the same chapter we're in, he says, I am going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back. Verse 28 here, this verse we're in, you heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to my father. Now they do love him, but they don't love him with the insight and, and, and perfection yet that, that they're gonna one they're gonna get to. They don't fully understand all that's going on. He says, If you love me, you'd understand this. I I'm going back to the Father. That's a that's a great thing. It means it means his work is finished. It means as he goes to the cross and rises from the dead, he has done what he set out to do. He has completed his work for you and for me and for the disciples and all of us, all of mankind providing sin. He has been faithful to that, sinless in that. And he's going back to his father. What a beautiful thing. Now, there's a phrase in this verse. We have to speak to it. Okay. He says, I'm going back to the father for the father. Here we go. Is greater than I. Now, there are some who come to this text, take these words right out of the mouth of Jesus and say, here Jesus, he's teaching that he is inferior to the Father. He's less to the Father than the Father. He's not God in the same sense that God the Father is. That's not at all what Jesus is teaching here. What is he communicating when he says this? The Father is greater than I. Well, we have to remember what John has already revealed to us about Christ. So let's do that. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, that's Christ. And the word was with God, and the Word was God. The Father and the Son, at the beginning of time, from all eternity past, together as co-equals in the Godhead. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the same in essence, 
and in nature. John 1, 14, and, and Jesus came, the word became flesh. And when he came, the glory of the Lord came with him. The glory of the Father came with him. And, and the glory of the Son was revealed. And, and we were able to see the glory of the Father through Christ. Hebrews 1, 3 reminds us that Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He is exactly the very essence and nature of the Father. There is nothing missing in the Son that is not in the Father. They are identically and equally God, fully. Philippians 2, verses 5 and 7. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he was God before he came, before he became in the flesh and was born uh, of a virgin. He was fully God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped because he was already God. Even when he became man, he was still fully God. But it says here he emptied himself. He gave up the visible, the, the visible manifestation of some of his attributes while he was here on earth. But let's really be clear what he's saying here. John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. You can't be any clearer than that. So when Jesus is saying, the Father is greater than I, what he's saying is this. I am, stepping black, I am stepping back. See here in John 14, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. We are, we are, we are organically intertwined in each other as fully God. He's saying when I go back to heaven, I am going back to where I, where, to where I already have lived from all eternity past. That is my, that is my home. Um, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That's where I naturally, organically belong, is, is in the very presence of the Father, in heaven, with him. I'm going home. And oh, by the way, I'm preparing a place for you. So he's communicating this to the disciples. It's a, it's a, it's a communication of victory, a communication of of. His deity, his divinity, he is going home. He's going to be with the Father. And that is a greater place to be. The Father is greater than I, but when I am with him, we are, we are together the same in essence in every way. The peace of God, it is, it's energized in our life through faith. Jesus continues, and he says in verse 29, And now I've told you, before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. He's going away. He says, I told you that so that you would, your faith would grow. That your faith would grow stronger. Isaiah 26.3 God, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The peace comes when we trust God. We, when we stand strong in the Lord and say, I believe you. God, I believe you. A peace comes into our heart. That's what he's talking about here. And then he says... Sixth, on sixth, he says, peace is settled in our lives. It is victory to settle through the victory that takes place. Verse 30, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you. I'm not going to be with you much longer. For the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. Well, he acknowledges here the spiritual warfare that's coming. He says the ruler is coming. In fact, it's already, he's already been there. He entered Judas Judas left that evening, Satan being in that group as Jesus is meeting with them here in the upper room. Satan is going to wreak havoc among the disciples tonight and tomorrow. They're going to flee and they're going to run. Jesus is going to go to the cross alone. Satan is at work here. Ephesians 2, 2, he is the prince of the power of the air. He's powerful. The results of his work are always disobedience. Ephesians 6 2 reminds us that, it, that what he does is spiritual in nature. He is evil incarnate. Everything he does is evil. The result of that is only evil. It is destructive and chaos in our life. John 12 reminds us that Jesus says, Judgment is coming now, though. When I go to the cross, judgment is coming, and the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. Romans 16 tells us that the God of peace is soon going to crush Satan. There's a day coming at the end of the millennial kingdom where Satan is going to be defeated with finale there. He was defeated at the cross, but he will his, his reign of terror, his influence of terror will end at the millennial kingdom, and he'll be thrown into hell for all eternity. 
But that victory has already been won. It's just, it's just yet to happen. Jesus won it at the cross. Why? Well, Jesus says he has no claim on me because Jesus is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. Jesus, he committed no sin and deceit was not in his mouth. Externally, Jesus never sinned. In his heart, Jesus never sinned. Satan had nothing on Jesus. No foothold, no blackmail, no scoop, no dirt, no sin to grab a hold of. There was nothing from the life of Jesus that Satan could work with to take advantage of. Jesus was spotless and sinless. Hebrews 7 reminds us that we have a, a high priest. He is holy. He is innocent. He is, he is unstained. That's, that's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. He is holy. He won the victory because his sacrifice before his father for sin was a holy sacrifice. And he won the victory over, over sin, over death, and over Satan. Finally, we see here that peace, it's, it's, it's rooted in obedience and, and love. Love for God. Verse 31, I do, I do as the Father commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And so Jesus, Jesus emphasizes how important obedience is. He emphasizes how important loving the Father is. Key, key to peace in the heart of a child of God is, is to do as the Lord did. It's, it's to obey the Word of God. It's to follow the Word of God. It's to honor the Word of God, to read it, and to say, Lord, because of what you have shown me, that is how I'm going to live my life. That's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to think. That's how my attitudes are going to adjust. Lord, change me. I'm going to obey your Word. And he says, not only that, I love the Father. We've already seen here in John, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That love relationship, we are defined by our love for the Lord. Our relationship is defined by that love that we have with him and for him. And that will come out in how we honor his word. As Jesus did that in his life, so are we to do that. Psalm 119 reminds us, great peace have those who love your law. When we love God's word and we honor it, there is, there is the peace of God in our life. Frankly, the reason that sometimes believers lack peace, there's many reasons. One of those is because we're not walking with the Lord. Proverbs 3 reminds us, My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will be added to you. He says here, because we keep his word, the result of that is going to be peace in our life, in our soul. Philippians 4, 7 reminds us, the peace of God, we can't understand it. We can't wrap our mind around it. It passes all understanding. We convey it with lives that are faithful to God. We convey it by faith in Christ. It will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the author of that peace. He is the sustainer of that peace. When we stand in Christ, we have, we have a protection in our life. You see, we seek the peace of God. He gives it to us. And that peace, that peace carries out the role then of being a guardian over our heart. Uh, it is protection over our heart. Uh, this peace is, is it's like a locked vault. It's like an encrypted file. It's, it's, it can't be broken. Where we become vulnerable, vulnerable is because we are vulnerable ourselves. We doubt. Christ, his promise to us is ironclad. He will keep it. It cannot and it will not be broken. And so we run to him constantly in prayer. We run to him constantly for a change in perspective to give thanks for what's happening in my life even though I don't understand. We run to him to enable us to do what he's asking us to do. We run to him to find the peace to sustain us each day. 2 Thessalonians reminds us here, it tells us this, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. May God give you peace all the time. May God give you peace in every way, in every circumstance. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It's Christ who will do that. It's Christ who promises that. This morning, your testimony has been strong, many of you, because I've seen the peace of God. By faith, you have believed that. You have you're living in a way that honors the Word of God. And when you do that, God gives peace in, into your life and mine. This morning, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, that's the first place to start. 
that you will come to peace with God through faith in Christ. Confessing sin to the Lord, yielding to Him and say, Lord, I need you. I need your grace and your mercy to change my life. I desire, I yearn for the peace of the peace of God that you promise and you offer. Lord, take my sins and wash them away and cleanse them. Lord, make me a new person in Christ. And in Christ, then, we are able to, to have the victory, to have the peace of God, which then becomes a stamp on our testimony for Christ, an opportunity to be a light for Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live by faith every day, to live in, a, in harmony with your word, to say every day when we, wake, when we wake up, God, I know you're able. God, you are sufficient. God, you, you are in control today of my day. Lord, take the emotions that, that will be a part of my day today and sustain them. Lord, help me to, to cast everything that's going to be a part of this day on you. Give me the peace that passes all understanding. Walk with me. Sustain me. Give a stillness to my soul in a world that's always swirling about me with challenges, with battles. And be my peace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.